it's great to get the opportunity to, to talk with you this afternoon around some of the big issues and challenges and outcomes in terms of leading change in the National Health Service in England. And I, I chose a kind of metaphor um, for the session this afternoon, and I chose change as a great big wrecking ball. Um, in a moment, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of the background and big change challenges that we have in the English National Health Service. And in a sense, you know, what we need to be is, as people like me, change agents, we need to be like a great big um, catch net, you know, embracing the change and saying, you know, bring it on, we're prepared. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So, as Connor said, I'm part of a team in the National Health Service in England at a national level called the Horizons Team. And, and we're rainmakers in the NHS. Really small team, there's about 20 of us. And what we do is we, we all over the world, we tune in, we connect with other people that are doing radical transformational change, other healthcare systems, other industries, and we bring that learning back to the NHS. And we've emerged through years and years of running big, uh, complex change programmes in the, in the National Health Service. So when I look back uh, to my uh, 27 years that I've worked in the NHS, um, my first big national job was to be one of Tony Blair's waiting list busters. And I spent six years going around the NHS um, helping uh, uh, hospitals and primary care and mental health organisations to reduce waiting times for patients. Um, I set up the first ever cancer improvement programme nationally um, in the NHS. And you know, over the years, I've, I've worked with, uh, with, with many, many projects. And you know, 27 years on, I'm still here, still doing it, uh, still very enthusiastic and, and passionate about the NHS. So this little team's a very, very special team. And we're very small, and we're purposely very small, and we're like this little group of radical people, like with one foot in the system and one foot outside of it. And kind of part of the way we work is how can a tiny team in a very big system leverage big change by the ways that we connect and we interact. And uh, this tiny team is the most socially influential team in the whole of the NHS. And every month we're having about a million and a half um, interactions with other people, um, sharing knowledge, um, uh, connecting people up with each other, uh, social media and, and many other uh, mediums. And, um, and we're big fans of PASL. And, you know, we work with, with a lot of different um, channels and, and systems, but we use... Um, Passel every single day as part of our work. So I've written a blog about my talk today um, on Passel, uh, which you can download, and I've also put the slides for this presentation onto um, LinkedIn SlideShare, so you can download the slides if you want as well. So I thought let's get going with a bit of interaction because here we all are kind of sat in this big room. So um, who's used Slido before? A few of us, great. So if, you're, if you've used it before, can you like be a coach okay, to the person um, next to you? So what I want you to do is, on your smartphone, go on to um, sly.do. If you haven't got any connectivity in this room, you need to go on to the Wi-Fi. Okay? And the, and the Wi-Fi code is 12345CAV. Okay? And, uh, and what I'd like you to do is to go, yeah, to go on to, uh, to Slido and it'll ask you to put an event code. It's got a hashtag already, but next to the hashtag, put Rainmaker19. And what you'll see there is a question, and the question is, um, can you uh, write down one thing you know or feel about the NHS in five words or less? Okay, so let's see. Yeah, we like that one, vital healthcare system, brilliant. We like that one, juggernaut, I think that's pretty true. Uh, creaking at the seams, we'll uh, see about that in a moment, okay? Free at the point of delivery, overworked, heart in the right place, that's how I feel. Um, underfunded, what's that word? Better? No, I've got too quick, okay? But, you know, we're kind of getting a sense, okay? Complex, big system, national treasure, does great stuff, but, um, but a few problems, okay? Vast, complicated, underappreciated, fundamental Okay, letting down um, trans and um, intersex people. Okay, amazing. Okay, overfunded needs splitting up. Okay, heroes. Okay, there's um, there's quite a diverse um, 
Okay, it's quite a diverse set. Let's, uh, let's keep them coming. So what I thought I'd do, first of all, is a bit of a, a, bit of a crash course on, um, on change in the NHS. Okay, so first thing to say about the NHS in England is that it is the world's largest publicly funded health system. And um, we in the NHS provide comprehensive health care to 54 million people. And every 36 hours in the NHS, we see a million people. Okay? And the NHS is funded by direct tax, which basically means that when you need to use it, it's free. And the NHS provides 95% of all the healthcare in England, and that's really stable. Okay? It, it hasn't gone up, it hasn't gone down, it, just, it remains at around uh, 95%. And the thing about it is that nearly everybody uses it, okay? no matter what our, our background. Okay? Second interesting fact, the, the NHS is the fifth biggest employer okay, in the globe, on the globe. Okay? The biggest is the US Department of Defence, followed by the People's Liberation Army, Walmart and McDonald's. Okay? And then across the, so across the NHSs, so we've got the English NHS, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, okay, 1.7 million people. It's a big system. Um, this was kind of reflected in, in what some of you were, um, were, were saying, you know. This is a clo uh, quote from Nigel Lawson, politician. The NHS is the closest thing the NHS have to a religion, with, with those who practice in it regarding themselves as a priesthood. This makes it quite extraordinarily difficult to reform, okay. Um, and again, we've got a little, little sense of that from what some of you were saying, okay. Just thought, I'd, like some people like data, just in terms of healthcare spending, and we, we look at the, um, what we spend in, uh, in Britain compared to other countries in the OECD, you know, what we can see is that we're, um, we're just above um, the, um, the average, okay? Um, you know, uh, at some point under 10%, um, uh, under but significantly less than many other countries. And that many of the other countries that are, that are um, uh, you know, spending a lower proportion of GDP um, tend to be countries that are lower income countries. Okay? You know, whatever you say about it, internationally we do well. So this is a, a study that's done very often um, in the, by the Commonwealth Fund of, um, of Washington, which is a very well regarded um, global think tank on health and care. And uh, based, based on a, um, a comparison of 11 different um, countries by multiple criteria, uh, we do the best. Okay? And again, there's other studies that might say different things, um, but this one says um, that by these criteria, um, you know, we do the best. And I don't stand here with kind of starry eyes saying, wow, isn't the NHS fabulous? I and mean, I do think it's fabulous, and I do think it's an amazing thing for us to have, particularly because I work in so many other healthcare systems and um, globally. But um, I also you know, work in areas like patient safety, patient experience, and I know that very often we let patients down as well. Okay? So like, like we have got a massive challenge in the NHS. Okay? Why do we have a big challenge? Because if you look at what's happening demographically, and I'm going to come on to this in a moment, um, big, big challenges. Okay? Patient and public expect change, expectations are changing massively. You know, somebody who's 75 or 80 years old now feels, you know, oh, I don't want to bother the doctor. Um, you know, I, um, I'll kind of, you know, try and sort this out myself. Whereas somebody, uh, you know, who's a millennial has got very, very different expectations and expects to get a service straight away. Um, and we want to do things in ways that are high quality, okay? If we um, divide that by the money that is available, what it basically tells us is um, we have to fundamentally change the way that we deliver health and care. Okay, let me show you something why this is um, so important. Okay. Who uses the NHS? Okay. We all use it, but mostly it's people over 65. Okay. So, um, uh, and what you, can you see what's happening in demographically? Okay. The, the population of people aged over 65 is rising and, and will continue to rise significantly. Okay. What we can see is a 30-year-old, some of the people in this room, um, don't, you know, don't cost us very much because they don't use it very much. Okay? A 65-year-old doesn't use it very much. Okay? Look how much an 85-year-old um, costs the NHS. Okay? This, is, this is really scary. This is called the dependency ratio. And what this basically shows is 
is the, uh, is the ratio of people of retirement age to people of working age. And obviously, the whole premise of the NHS is it's free, um, uh, you know, it's paid by tax, and it's free to use at the point of care. So obviously, we have to have enough people working to pay for all the people who don't work um, to be able to use it. And, you know, if you look, um, in 2010, the ratio was about, you know, 25 26%. We get up to um, uh, you know 2030 and beyond, and it's 35 um, plus. So you know how are we going to continue um, to, uh, to to fund this system? You know our children and our children's children. How are they, we going to make sure that they get the things, the health and care that we take for granted? Um, what I'd also say this is just showing how much of our proportion of gross domestic product we spend on healthcare, and what this is basically uh, showing. Okay, is that, you know, year by year, it's going up and up and up, more and more of our GDP is being spent on health. But what you see from 2010 onwards with austerity is the amount, that, the proportion of GDP that we're spending on healthcare is, is reducing. You know, lots of other people who work in the public sector think we're lucky in the NHS because, in a sense, we were um, protected from the austerity measures, which meant, for instance, you know, um, many um, local government systems had their funding cut by 40%. Okay? Our funding um, was, kept, was kept stable. But in a situation where of demographic changes, we need about 4% a year just to, um, to keep still. And the demand for NHS services is going up and up and up, and, and we've had to contain that. So, what are we doing? A few months ago, uh, beginning of the year, we published our, our, um, our 10 year plan. And what this is basically showing is you know, big radical changes coming to the NHS. You know, if we are going to sustain and uh, take forward our service, we need to do things in different ways. So at the moment, the NHS tends to be organised into separate sectors. So your local hospital is run by an NHS trust with a chief exec, and primary care is run by a group of GPs, and they're all completely separate sectors. Okay? The people that run the hospitals is different from the people that run primary care, is different from the people that run mental health, is different from the people that run community services. And what's happening now is that they're all being integrated. They're coming together. And in a sense, what we're starting to do is to wrap patient services okay, around the, the patient and people's needs, rather than make people go to different um, sectors. Okay? Um, 90% of all the interventions in the NHS are in primary care. Okay? So we've got to shift resources away from big uh, supply-driven hospital systems into more uh, prevention and primary support in primary care. So this is a very, very big thrust that's going on. Okay? Um, personalised care. So you know, how do we make the NHS feel you know, hugely personalised? Um, you know, very individual care and do it on a very big scale. One of the big, big themes that we're seeing in our long-term plan is social prescribing. Okay? Many people that go to visit their, their GPs um, you know, with all kinds of illnesses, you know, particularly with, um, with um, depression, anxiety, other mental health issues, um, actually the issues that are going on in their lives aren't, aren't things that the NHS can sort out. You know, their, their, their money issues, their loneliness issues. So social prescribing means that we actually bring um, people from, the, from local communities um, to be advisors. And, in, and instead of as well as prescribing drugs, you know, we can, pre we can prescribe um, a dancing class. Okay? We can prescribe um, going to the gym. Uh, we can pr uh, prescribe social groups. We can, pre we can actually prescribe and pay for, from the NHS, all kinds of activities to help keep people well. Okay? Big focus on um, big clinical priorities, so massive push um, on cancer. You know, we're doing really well on, on cancer. We used to have um, uh, some of the worst outcomes in Europe on cancer. Been such a push that now our five-year survival rates on some of the key cancers, like breast cancer, have overtaken France and Germany. Um, cardiovascular, respiratory, big focus on mental health and bringing together mental and physical health. Okay. Um, you know, when I showed you the diagram before, um, you know, how things change for people between the age of 65 and 85. So another big focus on ageing well and supporting people who are moving into frailty. And going back 
um, focusing upstream on prevention, personal responsibility and tackling health inequalities. So huge, huge changes happening in our sector. And as some of you described it, a juggernaut, you know, this massive system, okay, you know, um, a million and a half people working in it. So how do we make change happen? Um, this is Gary Hamill. Um, he, according to the Financial Times, he's the number one business influencer in the world. And he says, you know, when we think about tomorrow's management systems, we'll need to value diversity, dissent and divergence as highly as conformance, consensus and cohesion. And if you think about the NHS, you know, we, we want to be operationally excellent. We want to make sure that every patient gets safe, high quality care. So we need lots of this. And we're in, a, we're, we're in an environment where, where money is really difficult and money is really tight. So we need to get a management grip. We need to manage out risks. Okay? We need to do those things. And you know, we need to be valuing doing things differently, diversity, dissent, and divergence. And I think we have to be working with both. Um, this isn't necessarily talking about the NHS, but I agree with this. You know? Um, you know, when I think about myself as a leader of change, um, I think we're in this kind of really interesting place um, because, uh, you know, when I think about so much of the change activity that we're involved in, you know, these um, organic, emergent, human-focused um, human forces, you know, about social connection, and actually many of the ways that our organisations operate are, um, are more like a machine world, okay? This helps me loads, and we use this all the time thinking about power in organisations and systems. And what I'd say is happening, not just in my sector, but in other sectors as well, we're seeing this big battle, this big tension between old power and new power in organisations. And um, old power is like a currency, it's like money. Some people have got a lot of it, formal authority, and most people haven't. So old power is held by a few people and we push it down the organisation and we command it. And I'll give you NHS examples because that's my world. You know, we say you've got to do that because it's the quality standard um, for, uh, for response times. Or you've got to do that because it's the policy or the protocol. Or you've got to do that because we've got to balance the books at the end of the year. And old power is closed. So if I'm the chief exec of a hospital system and I'm working with leaders of the local community, I can't command them to do anything. Okay? My, my authority ends at, at the door. And old power is transactional. It's about holding people to account. It's about governance, uh, structures, processes and systems. Let's contrast that with new power. New power is like a current. It's like a surge of energy. And new power happens when many people with the, uh, with the same goals and values come together. And the more people that engage in our new power campaign or movement, then the more power we've got. We can pull it into our organisations and systems. It's shared, it's open. And one thing I'd say about new power is that it's relational. And what we mean by that is people will engage in new power ways because they want to, because it fits with who they are in the world and makes a difference. Whereas an old power world, in an old power world, we have to do it because it's the quality standard or the policy or, um, or the practice. Now, my job, Chief Transformation Officer, I get to connect with some pretty cool people around the world, you know, futurists and scenario planners and forward thinkers. Um, lots of them are forecasting the death of old power. I don't think that old power will be dying in any healthcare system I know anytime soon. Okay? Um, it's, um, it's alive and kicking. But what we're seeing are these opportunities, like a layer of new power coming on the top that creates all kinds of possibilities. So, you know, what we say as change leaders is that we have to be able to operate in that very difficult, zigzaggy place in the middle. So, what I thought we'd do, we'll have another poll, okay? So, thinking about old power and new power, I'm going to give you, um, I've got a poll here, and what you can see there is number one is mostly old power, okay? Number two, and, and through to number, um, number five, which is mostly new power, okay? So, looking at that, okay, just give yourself a score from, um, from one to five, and um, what you can see is... One is mostly old power, and five is mostly new power. So, where are you? Okay, we're a pretty, okay, we're a pretty new power bunch, except um, 
Uh, yeah, number two on, um, on old power is kind of creeping up. Okay, so there's not many of us that are like, like really old power, but um, again, there's um, uh, quite a lot of uh, different perspectives there. So, let's carry on. Okay, this is some data that's really influenced me a lot. It comes from two Canadian researchers, uh, Batalana and Kos Chiaro. And these two Canadian researchers went into a very big organisational system. And what they wanted to find out is what makes a, a really good change agent or change leader. Okay? Is it the people who have got the formal power in an old power sense, or is it the people who how are the, the centres of informal influence? Okay? Who makes the best change agents? So these two Canadian researchers went into a very big organisational system and they followed 67 change projects around this big system. Okay. Does anybody know what the name is of the system that these two Canadian researchers went round? Okay. It was the English NHS. Yay. And, um, and you know, um, like we're about as old power as you can get because, in a sense, we don't just have one hierarchical system, we have two. Because we have a hierarchical system like, you know, who are the formal people in the organisation? And then we have a 400-year-old hierarchical system based on a kind of clinical hierarchy with doctors at the top, nurses quite a long way down, and patients at the bottom, you know? So, um, but, you know, even, even in a system like ours, okay, what the researchers found is that people who are at the centre of informal influence have got far more ability to make change happen than people at the top of the formal hierarchy. And this isn't just in the NHS, there's loads of research in different sectors you know, f uh, that, that says this. This, is, um, this quote comes from Leandro Herrero who writes about viral change and he says, people who are highly connected have twice as much power to influence change as people with hierarchical power. And you know, we see this all the time in our world and very often I'll talk to people and they'll say, Helen, you know, I'm only a staff nurse or I'm only a junior doctor or I'm only a student. You know, what can I do? What power have I got? Actually, we've got a lot of power and, and a very big part of what my team does is to support people to take their power to make change happen. Now, one of the big trends that we've seen in the last 10 years is the growth of organisational network analysis to understand what goes on in organisations. This comes from a Danish organisation that we work with called Innovisor. And Innovisor have been into, you know, 100 plus organisations doing detailed analysis. And what their analysis shows is that in most organisations or systems, there's about 3% of people who are the informal influencers. They are, we, we call them the super connectors, okay? These 3% of people will drive conversations with 85% of other people. So if you're trying to make change happen okay, in, your, in your big formal system, actually understanding who the informal influencers are is, is really important. Because where the informal influencers are on your side and they're moving the change in the same direction, then it will really help drive your change forward. If the super connectors, the 3%, are against your change, then it creates lots of problems. Okay? So how do we find our super connectors? Well, we can bring in a company that can do the ONA for us, or we can just go around and ask people, you know? Um, when you've got a problem at work, you know, who, who do you talk to? Or who, who is your kind of trusted source of information? So, um, so this is Mandy, and she's a very typical 3% person in the NHS. Um, she works at Yeovil Hospital in Somerset, and, um, and she is a super connector. And how do we know that? Well, when you ask people about Mandy, they say she knows everyone in the hospital. If you actually wanted some empirical evidence of Mandy's status, we just go and look at her Facebook page, okay? Because she is friends with hundreds and hundreds of people at Yeovil Hospital. And why she's so powerful is because if there's something happening in the organisation, like there's a new policy coming, or there's you know, um, potential restructuring, then people go and ask Mandy, you know, what do you think of it? What's happening? And what she does is that she makes sense of things, she creates meaning, and she reduces ambiguity for people. And again, if she really understands what's going on and she is um, moving in the same direction as the change, that's great, okay? If she's actually advising people against the change, then it's very problematic. Now, 
the clever leadership at Yeovil Hospital kind of worked this out about Mandy. And she is a, like a senior nurse, a middle manager. So they gave her this special job, which is called being the head of patient flow. And so what she does is she works with teams across the hospital, identifying what's blocking patients from kind of moving forward when they need to and helping to remove the blockages. Okay? And she presents her own award. It's called the Carney Cup. And, uh, and people really covet this cup. And she's a, you know, she's a senior nurse, she's a middle manager. She's nobody of status in the organisation. But people covet the Carney Cup as if they were getting it, like from the chief exec of the NHS, you know, because it's so well um, regarded. And, you know, sometimes those of us that are senior leaders, okay, we may actually be less influential than we think because what the data shows us is... If we want to get the same level of influence that we get th by working through people like Mandy, the 3% people with informal influence, uh, but, we, but we want to get that through doing things in traditional ways of cascading, okay, then we actually need four times more resources to do it in a kind of top-down cascading way. Okay, I just want to show you um, a case study of kind of change in the NHS, and I just want to make this real. So I want to, first of all, show you something about this change in an old power way, and then I want to show you it in a new power way. Okay? So we have a particular problem in the NHS in England, which is called um, detox. Okay? And a detox is a delayed transfer of care, detox. And basically what happens is um, it's mostly elderly people over the age of 80. They come into the hospital, and then something needs to happen for them to be able to leave the hospital. Leave. So they need a social care package, or they temporarily need to go into um, a care home, or they need to go into a care home permanently, or they need an assessment. And what happens is these, these elderly people can end up being stuck in hospital for days or even weeks while they're waiting okay, for, um, for whatever it is that they need. That's called the detox. And the problem is that when hospital beds are full of people who don't actually need to be in hospital, but we can't move them on, then other people can't come into the hospital. Okay? So it's, it's a, it is a very big pro it's a problem for everybody, okay, from lots of different viewpoints. So our government, okay, that work in old power ways, what do they do? Okay? They have an old power solution to this problem. They basically they say, we're going to have some new performance metrics. So from now on, the number of hospital beds that have got somebody in them whose care, whose care has been delayed, okay, um, our new performance metric is no more than 3.5% of your beds can have somebody in it who's a detox. Okay? And um, many of these people are waiting for an assessment for something, like a continuing care assessment. So if you're waiting for an assessment, you need to have, this, you need to have the assessment after you've left the hospital, not waiting in the hospital for it. So less than 15% of assessments can happen in the hospital while the patient's in the hospital bed. And we're having a new performance dashboard standardised so that we can measure this and we can performance manage you every hospital on doing this. Okay? So this is our detox performance management system. That is a classic NHS old power top-down way of doing things. Okay? So um, let's, look at, let's look at things in a new power way. There are lots of our nurses and physiotherapists that are getting very, very upset about the human consequences of this happening. So they set up their own campaign, and it's called hashtag end PJ paralysis. Okay? And what they mean by that is the paralysis that happens when um, mostly elderly people get stuck in a hospital bed. And um, this is like one of the posters they did. But, you know, when you look at some of this data, it's pretty compelling, OK? For people over the age of 80, if you spend 10 extra days in a hospital bed, it can age your muscles by 10 years. And one week of bed rest results in 10% muscle loss. That's what the evidence shows us. And actually, the loss of strength that you as an older person can get by being stuck in a hospital bed in your bed clothes can make the difference between you being dependent and have to then go into a care home and you being able to go home. So they just started this campaign, let's mobilise our patients, let's end this PJ paralysis. And as soon as somebody is well enough to sit up in bed, to take their bed clothes off and put proper clothes on, uh, let's do it. And it started in a couple of hospitals and it just started to spread around the system. So um, 
you know, it was, it was a very frontline thing um, by our clinical colleagues. And it, and it kind of grew and grew. So then our chief nurse of England said, let's have a 70-day challenge, okay? We'll all, we'll all across the country, we'll implement uh, the ideas from, from um, end PJ paralysis. And what we'll do is we'll try and save a million bed days. So, you know, um, people were doing it. And the thing is, it was a, it was a bottom-up, it was, it was peer-led, and there were some really kind of clear things that you could do um, to enable that. And all over the country, you know, you're seeing these little, hun you know, the, the, the challenge, what happened, and um, everybody measuring it. And, you know, often when you try and get clinical staff to measure things, performance, like people don't want to do it. But be this, because it kind of connects with a bigger, um, a bigger issue, you know, we're really happy to do it. And um, this is just some social um, uh, analytics metrics. But what it's basically showing us is when you look at how it's spread and these ideas around hashtag um, uh, NPJ paralysis, what you're seeing here is that um, it's driven by super connectors. Again, 85% um, of the content that is being retweeted comes from 3% of people who tweet. So across the country, you've got these really powerful nurses and physiotherapists, frontline staff, who are, um, who are at the centre of this information uh, going out. And the green lines just show how it's connecting. And honestly, as professional communicators who work in cascading ways, we couldn't do it anything as, uh, as well or as powerfully as this. And then, like, everyone's doing it their own way all over the country in ways that work for them. So then the staff start to say, can we have days of action? Um, so, um, so yeah, you know, we say, um, yeah, you can have a day of action. Um, uh, you know, um, chief nurse, yeah, you can have a day of action. So, um, so what starts happening? Okay, the staff start coming to work for their days of action, um, dressed in pajamas, and um, that's Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital, that's University Hospitals, uh, uh, Morecambe Bay, that's East Sussex Healthcare. But you know, our staff are owning it themselves, and it connects in with their bigger purpose. And what was pretty amazing, okay, was. You know, connecting up with the things that really matter to staff saved 710,000 bed days of um, patients who would have either been in a hospital bed or, um, or a bed in a, in a care home. And doing things this way, okay, is way more effective than kind of trying to push it down uh, through a performance management system. So, I'd say, you know, just thinking around this and thinking around what's happening in the NHS and some of the big change challenges that we face. I think there's two really big systems, big questions for us in the future. How do we work interdependently as part of a bigger system rather than independently? And connected to that, how do we build shared purpose? And this, comes, this quote comes from one of my favourite um, Twitter friends uh, at Complex Wells. And there he says, and it is a he, complex systems are driven by the quality of the interactions between the parts, not the quality of the parts. Working on discrete parts or processes can properly bugger up the performance at a system level. Okay? Never fiddle with a part unless it also improves the system. And you know, as we're moving towards much more integrated care in the NHS, where we're designing the pathways of care around the patient, rather than making the patient go to the hospital, go to the primary care um, setting, go to community services. You know, we're, we're, we're bringing them all together around, around the patient, you know, kind of really starting to understand that. And, you know, when I went to improvement school, quality improvement school in the NHS quite a long time ago, I was taught how to set up and run independent uh, quality improvement projects. So, you know, we'd, we'd have a topic or something we wanted to improve. So I just picked one from primary care here. We want to improve smoking cessation rates amongst people with asthma and lung disease. So what do we do? We create a nice improvement project and we, we draw a boundary around it. You know, this is my project, this is what's in the scope of it. And we use particular quality improvement tools like statistical process control and fishbone diagrams and PDSA or PDCA um, cycles. Okay? And, and there's a place for that. But increasingly, we need to be working interdependently. And when we say interdependent, what we mean is, um, you know, my team or my organisation, we've got our own goals and stuff that we need to achieve. But we're only going to achieve that by working collaboratively with other people. And, you know, we've come from an NHS system where we've set up loads of independent organisations and an internal market. And we're kind of, we're slowly moving away from that to actually, you know, integrating care across, um, across whole systems. So this one here, you know, improve the response to someone presenting to primary care in a mental health crisis. 
You can't put a little boundary around that project. You know, we've got to work with patients um, and families and their representatives. We've got to work with ambulance services, mental health services, emergency departments, police, primary care, voluntary sector. So the ways that we're working more and more, they're social and collaborative, they're built on shared purpose, and you can't just use a few improvement tools, you know. We need multiple methods. And we are fundamentally shifting the way that we think, moving from like, what I'd call an inward mindset to an outward mindset. So, you know, when we think about an inward mindset, it's my organisational group, my hospital, my primary care organisation, my mental health service, to actually understanding that it's a, you know, integrated in a bigger system. We're moving from my particular interest to our shared purpose, from organisational silos um, to collaboration, from this kind of tunnel vision around what I need to achieve for my organisation uh, through to awareness. And many of our behaviours that... Um, are protecting or advancing me and my group. You know, I've got to get the best for my hospital in this system, you know, to actually behaviours that advance the collective result. It's where we need to go. So, you know, working more interdependently, okay, that, that, that you know, starts with the needs of patients, mean that we have to start with shared purpose. And, and I'd say one of the big, big shifts that we're seeing is when we're working collectively with other people, we have to start with a place of, from a place of shared purpose. And, you know, we, we start off with the hour. Who needs to be part of this? Um, you know, in the old days, we're doing loads of change, and we just, like we as healthcare professionals are doing the change. And now we have to work with, with a bigger community. You know, we have to co-create things with our patients. We need to work with others um, in the system with, you know, when it comes to mental health, for instance, in the community, we need to be working with, with, with the police service, okay? We need to be working with the voluntary sector, okay? So we need to start off with the hour. Who needs to be part of this? Then we have the shared. You know, what are the things that unite us? And there's very many things that divide us, but, you know, what brings us together in a new power way to, to work on this, um, on this project or this mission together? And then finally is purpose, you know? Why are we taking this action? How does this action connect with the things that really matter to us? So I was just going to connect this back and give you a practical example, which is one that we were just looking at with NPJ paralysis. Okay? So, you know, what's our shared purpose on, with NPJ paralysis? Okay, so who is the hour? Okay? There's lots of us. Um, you know, we start with patients and families, um, but then we work with all kinds of different clinical professionals, we work with students, we work with senior leaders. You know, what unites us? What do we share? Anger and outrage are older patients deteriorating when we could do something about it. So it starts from a place of emotions, a place of, a place of values. And then what's our purpose? Why are we engaging in end PJ paralysis? To make sure that every person who is in a hospital bed gets mobilised when they're ready, both clinically and personally, and that every person gets choice and a chance for the future life they want. You know, this is social justice, okay? So, you know, we're in, a, in an NHS system, but very often we're doing improvement projects, you know. What's the aim of our improvement project? <coughs> to reduce cost and improve quality. You know, how does that ever connect? And I think, you know, we, more and more we have to get back um, to this place of shared purpose. And, you know, we do this purpose test. You know, when, when people are, are writing shared purpose statements, this is our purpose test, this quote from Nida, you know. Purpose is the deepest dimension within us our central core or essence, where we have a profound sense of who we are, where we come from and where we're going. Purpose is the quality that we choose to shape our lives around. Purpose is a source of energy and direction. And again, you know, when you, when, when you put those words up at the beginning around the NHS, okay, lots of those things were really, like, profound and amazing. And I think, you know, very often we get so focused on, you know, delivery and, um, and operational um, aspects and, um, and doing things within budget that, you know, very often we kind of lose the essence of what we're about. And, and I think we're in a process of, um, of going back to that. And the um, very final thing I wanted to say is the evidence on this is clear, not just in the NHS, but like across the world, okay? If we want people to take action for change, the most effective way of doing that is by linking with emotions through values. Again, when I went to improvement school quite a few years ago, what I got taught, okay, I'm a, I'm a social scientist, a sociologist, um, was that if I wanted to engage medical doctors in change, I had to show them a graph, okay? Because doctors, medical doctors, will only be motivated to 
um, engage in change if we show them data. Do you know it's not true? Even medical doctors are far more likely to engage in change through emotions and values than by data. And of course we love data, but in a sense we, we have to connect you know, data with that, with the bigger cause. So, end of my session, so I thought what we do is we just have one last question, okay? Okay, in the last um, 40 minutes, what have you learned, what new thing have you learned about the NHS, okay? And let's see what we come up with. Oh, that's nice. Hope, yeah, I feel that too. Purpose. That's nice. Did you employ it? How progressive it's some. Yeah, you can wear pajamas to I know, isn't it great? You can wear pajamas to work. Yeah. And you know, sometimes actually we we come from very different contexts, but actually um, um, a lot of things unite us, you know, um, a, a, across sectors. And um, I, I hope that. Um, you know, that's been um, helpful and useful. And, um, yeah, look forward to the rest of the afternoon. So thank you. Thank you.